So um, today we have with us uh, all uh, four uh, editors of the volume and also one contributor, uh, which I will shortly introduce and then uh, I will uh, let them in introduce the, the volume itself. So um, a few words about uh, uh, our today's guests. Uh, by the way, I'm Alexander Boskovic, <laughs> and uh, I'm a, a co-deputy director of the Central European Center, and also uh, work at the Slavic department here. Um, so with us today are uh, Professor Oliver Botta, who is a professor of art history and associate director at the School of Art at the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg. Uh, and uh, his research deals with the nexus of uh, biocentrism and modernism, the Hungarian avant-garde, Laszlo Mohol-Linaj, uh, Canadian modernism, and the origins of the new media art that uh, are mainly uh, his research focus. And he is also the author of Technical Detours, the early mohol reconstructed uh, from 2000, and, uh, reconsidered, sorry, from 2006, and uh, Sensing the Future, mohol uh, Media and the Arts from 2014, He's also the author of many uh, articles, book chapters, uh, exhibition catalogs as well. And he's also a co-editor of uh, Biocentrism and Modernism uh, collection of essays. Um, today with us is also Irina Denishenko, uh, who is an assistant professor at the Department of Slavic Languages and the uh, Women and Gender Studies program at Georgetown University. Uh, and uh, her work, work focuses on the 20th century literature and visual art, uh, especially the avant-garde. Uh, and in addition to the several editing and translating projects, she's finishing her book manuscript on Vladimir Mayakovsky, entitled uh, Lyrical Nomadism and Democratic Representation in Art. Um, today with us virtually in Zoom are um, uh, two co-editors from Budapest, Hungary, uh, Gabor uh, Dobo, uh, who has been a research fellow at the Kashak Museum. Uh, he, is focused, he focuses on modernist periodicals of the interwar period with a special emphasis on the East and Central European region. And currently he is a principal investigator of the research project uh, that um, researches the correspondence between Lajos Kashak and uh, Yolande Simon between, uh, in, in, within the first two uh, decades of the 20th century. Uh, and he is also a committee member of the European Society for Periodical Research and was a co-organizer co of the conference in Budapest in uh, 2022. Um, on Zoom, we have also um, uh, Merce Pal Zeredi, who is an art historian and director of the Topi Literary Museum, Kashak Museum in Budapest. Uh, his research focuses on Hungarian avant-garde during the te teens and 20s, uh, especially on Lajos Kashak and his magazine Ma today, uh, between 20s and tw 20 and 25. And uh, he has published essays uh, in academic journal, edited volumes and exhibition catalogs, and he's also a co-editor of the volume on Lajos Kashak's avant-garde journals uh, entitled Art in Action. And uh, last but not least, today with us in person is uh, Megan Forbes, Forbes uh, who, is, uh, who works as a writer, researcher, curator, translator, and gardener. Uh, she's currently um, co-curator of Lucia Mokoli Exposures, uh, exhibition that is opening in May this year in um, Prague at uh, Kunsthalle Prague. And uh, her monograph, um, Technologies for the Revolution, the Czech avant-garde in print will be published in spring 2025. And she is also a solo editor of the International Perspectives on Publishing Platforms, Image Object Text uh, that was published uh, in 2019. So, um, Warm welcome, yeah. uh, and thank you everyone who uh, show up today. So we'll have um, our editors um, uh, say a few words about the volume itself. We'll also have uh, a contributor uh, say something about her research, and uh, then we will uh, have a little discussion in which we will invite not only people present here to engage in the discussion, but also people who are uh, uh, following us via Zoom. Uh, so you can 
uh, during these talks, you can also post your questions and we will address them in discussion section later on. Perfect. Um, Thank okay. you so much for such a generous introduction, Sasha. Uh, maybe we could share that PowerPoint when we get a chance um, on the screen. Um, thank you to Megan, one of our authors, for joining us. And of course, to the audience for coming out. We're also grateful to Columbia University and the East Central European Center at the Harriman Institute for um, hosting us. Um, and to Alarich Kolf and um, Eileen Hewn for having us, um, for, for, for organizing the event. Um, so we are launching uh, Cannibalizing the Canon Data Techniques in Central and Eastern Europe, um, which collects uh, cutting edge research on avant-garde in the region, focusing specifically on um, their engagement with data. Um, and the book makes three main interventions in existing scholarship on Dadaism and the avant-garde more broadly. Um, the first is that it approaches data as a series of techniques rather than as an organized movement. Um, and in part as a consequence of this techniques approach, uh, the volume reconceptualizes the relationship of data to adjacent avant-garde movements, both on an international scale, um, say in, in, with respect to um, Italian futurism or constructivism or surrealism, and on a more like local scale vis-a-vis um, -vis Polish formism or Hungarian activism. So it ends up advocating for plurality, hybridity, and something that we call um, cannibalization as a conscious artistic practice employed by artists in the region. Um, and last and perhaps most important intervention in the volume um, is that it is conceived as a corrective to the persistent notion that data is a Western phenomenon. And so um, all three of these are reflected, all, all three of these interventions, I think, are reflected in the title of our volume. And I will speak about the first two while my colleagues at the Kashak Museum in Budapest will address uh, the last one, the concept of East Central Europe and how that has come into play specifically uh, with respect to data scholarship, but also um, to the avant-garde more broadly in the region. Um, so the volume raises a seemingly basic question of what was data or what is data? And is it a movement akin to Italian futurism in terms of being a specific network of artists who subscribed to certain artistic techniques um, and developed artistic practices on the basis of these ideas? Um, and if it was a movement, how did affiliation work um, in the movement? Was it centralized? Could artists claim membership without being acknowledged by others and so on? Um, and one of the implicit conclusions that the volume draws is that although Dada was referred to as a movement, um, even by the founders, let's see if that works, maybe not. Uh, just the next slide. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Just yes. Back all the time. Oh, no point on there. To just for us to the Yeah. Yeah. Without. I see what you're looking at. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Here we go. Um, so, although data was referred to as a movement by founders like Tristan Serra. Um, uh, and uh, on the slide, you see one of the um, letterheads that um, he created and used a um, hundred or so years later, movement doesn't seem like an adequate notion to capture the complexity of data activity in the first several decades of the 20th century. Um, moreover, movement turns out to be complicit in some pretty exclusionary practices uh, of the dadis themselves. So to give a couple of familiar examples, um, different artists claim to belong to Dada at different times, uh, which suggests that Dada was a voluntary affiliation. And one particular case that we might think of here is the New York Dada, uh, retroactively claiming a label of uh, Dada artistic activity or uh, retroactively claiming the label of Dada for artistic activity that they engaged in before they had heard of the, the data in Zurich, where uh, the term was coined, at least according to um, data mythology. So even in today's exhibitions, uh, very frequently, we encounter works um, by Marcel Duchamp, for example, um, that are cited as canonical data, but are technically uh, pre-data, proto-data works. 
um, and there's no acknowledgement of this fact. Um, or another example is Richard Huslebeck's Data Manifesto of 1949, written some 20 years after the historical uh, data movement. So we have um, also many cases of artists who were involved in data events in Zurich, but who distanced themselves from the movement, often for reasons that had less to do with the movement's aesthetics or politics, uh, at least directly, than with the social and political context of the time. And here we might remember um, Emmy Hennings, uh, who disavowed her participation in data later on in life, um, or Sophie Teuber, Oh, that worked for you. Good. <laughs> I've got the time. Uh, um, who uh, seemed to put distance between herself and the scandalous movement, uh, perhaps uh, because in the rather conservative Swiss society, she was concerned with her reputation as a teacher at the Zurich School of Arts and Crafts. Um, and finally, we have artists from Central and Eastern Europe who developed similar artistic practices to data, but were not counted among data members by the Western centers and their impresarios. Um, and they did not necessarily want to be counted by them as data either. So movement with clear membership doesn't seem to capture the complexity of the artist's relationship to data and often also participates in exclusionary practices. Um, and um, on the latter point, many of the performance artists who were involved in Nada, and many of those performance artists happened to be women, did not make um, the famous data lists or the annals of art history. Um, so following more recent studies, our volume opts to present data in terms of artistic techniques and strategies instead. Um, and this choice allows us to include uh, parallel artistic experimentation from Central and Eastern Europe that was not necessarily conceived within the rubrics of the Dada movement, but was nevertheless shaped by similar historical developments as Dada, for example, um, politicization of art around World War I. Um, it also allows us to consider artistic practices that predate Zurich Dada, for example, um, but are similar in spirit. Um, the broader notion of techniques allows us also to move away from the fetishization of the manifesto um, and of data artworks that lend themselves more easily to canonization and museumification. So more ephemeral artistic genres such as performances receive substantial attention in our volume. Um, moreover, some contributions consider lifestyles um, as data artistic practices, for example, one article discusses the Hungarian Emil Sitias Vega Bondism as a radical form of uh, transnational data artistic practices. Um, so on the second, briefly on the second intervention, um, plurality, hybridity, and cannibalization can be viewed as specific ways of conceptualizing the artistic activity um, in Central and Eastern Europe, where data techniques were often mixed with other strategies and agendas and directed against Western artistic hegemony. Um, because news of actual data from Zurich reached East Central Europe rather late, it is often assumed that artists from the region simply passively imitated um, another new Western artistic trend. Um, however, such a view doesn't take into account the plurality of purposes to which data techniques were put in the region. So this um, metaphor of cannibalization, which we borrow from the dataists themselves, though we kind of change the valences of the term, emphasizes this active appropriation of data techniques. Um, and um, as a kind of um, the image that we use um, on the cover, you saw it earlier, well, we don't need to go back to that slide. Um, uh, this is the image that we use. Um, it, I think it's illustrative of the repurposing of data techniques and languages by East Central European artists. Um, it's a reproduction of Francis Picabia's um, now lost Meccano data work entitled Cannibalism, which was printed in Lajos Kashak and Laszlo Mohelinadi's uh, Book of New Artists, as well as um, separately in uh, Kashak's journal uh, Moth, or, or today, uh, and in the former publication, uh, in the Kashak Mokhulinaj um, publication, Pikabia's work um, is included 
not simply as an example of a, a latest Western trend and a model for emulation, um, rather it is there as an um, image that plays a role in the Hungarian artist's narrative of the origin and the evolution of the avant-garde where Dada occupies far from the last and final most perfect stage. So the appropriation of Dada languages in East Central Europe is often linked uh, with critique and not only critique of bourgeois taste, militarism and nationalism that we find in Zurich Dada as well, um, but also of Dadaism as a product of decaying uh, bourgeois society soon to be replaced by revolutionary socialism and so on. So the active appropriation and reinterpretation of Dada techniques in Central and Eastern Europe shows that the art of the avant-gardes in the region is not simply an epiphenomena, not a footnote in Western art history, but an artistic phenomena worthy of study in its own right. And um, now I will um, cede the floor to uh, Oliver Botar, who will talk uh, a little bit about um, the different sections of the book and also expand on our interventions if I happen to miss something and yeah, fill, fill that out a little bit and then we'll go to um, our uh, Kashak Museum sure. participants. Thank you, Rina. I actually don't have that much to add to what you said. <laughs> You've done such a wonderful job in uh, in um, uh, uh, describing the uh, the structure of the book, but it was really a, it was the result of a lot of discussion on our parts uh, because, and there, you know, and, and I think that, that um, the discussion reflected some tensions which are still there in the book as things stand. I mean, we had a we had a discussion about, for example, should we use the term East Central Europe? Are we not then playing into the standard narrative of you know Western Europe and Eastern Europe? And we actually discussed some of the earlier, a, a very important earlier uh, volume on uh, entitled Data East, which which kind of had the same tension. So it's kind of very difficult to 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 try and approach to try and break out of certain um, topoi of, uh, of art history and of cultural history uh, when it comes to, to dealing with center and periphery. We were really trying to do that. I don't know if we've succeeded 100%, but we certainly made some, some inroads into or, or interventions. So that, that's why I think that the, uh, I'm, I'm pretty happy with the, uh, with the, with the, with the breakdown of the, of the, of the uh, sections. Of, uh, of in exclusions, so you know, thinking about who was who was in, who was out, uh, and there, for example, you know, we were we were not successful in finding anybody to uh, to address the question of how queer Dada was. Uh, in I mean, it, it, by its very nature, actually, it is uh, from the point of view of queer studies and the definition of that 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 way of thinking about queer. Dadaism is by its very nature queer, and yet we couldn't really find anybody to talk about, I mean, to write about that in specifically, although it does come up here and there. And, you know, it was it was very difficult also to find uh, people willing to write about women in Dada. I mean, uh, and 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 as Irina um, implied or actually referred to at a certain moment, you know, some of those women may not have been wanted, may not have wanted to be described as Dada, and yet they were implicated, they were they, they were connected, they they performed within data contexts. And of course, because, and this brings us to perform performativities, performance by its very nature is not documented the way that other art forms are. And I know as an art history professor, how difficult it is to move beyond, you know, painting, sculpture, uh, graphic art, maximum, perhaps, you know, early cinema or whatever, if you're teaching the avant-garde, it's very difficult to break out of those medial strictures and those kind of those, those, um, those medial hierarchies and to teach performance. Uh, it's even difficult to teach more recent performance where you get the, uh, you know, I mean, I, I do teach it. I taught it the other day in my class on Canadian art since World War II, you know, but I, I, I had to buy those those VHS tapes 20 years ago, they're no longer available. Do they still work? Does the VHS player still work? So there are all kinds of, uh, all kinds of problems with, um, with uh, 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 trying to grasp and to connect with uh, media that, are, that were not documented to the extent that others were. What I love about the anthology actually, for example, Megan's uh, uh, contribution 
And there are others as well. The, there's, there's, a con there's a chapter about the Green Donkey Theater in Budapest. There are others as well. Is that people have been able to locate these, these photographs, these documentary photographs from newspapers, from journals, that kind of thing. And, you know, I mean, one wishes that there was, that every one of these, uh, every one of these theatrical performances or dance performances had hired photographers <laughs> and that those photographs, you know, were in the archives, but they're just not. So, so um, uh, uh, I think we've done a fairly good job in trying to, in trying to capture um, some media or, or our contributions in media that were not that well doc, uh, uh, documented. Transpositions, um, we were trying to think about, about, um, about ways in which uh, artists perhaps moved around or they moved through different styles. On my own contribution, for example, is on Moholy Nod, and I've, I, I'm known as a Moholy Nod scholar, and, and I always shied away from his so-called Dada period because it's very badly documented. A lot of the work isn't that even that good artistically. Uh, it's unclear exactly what his connections were or were not. And in the end, I was happy to come across a, um, um, a, a, a line or a, a, a quip by Kurt Schwitters, who in fact is, uh, is, is, appears in other moments in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the anthology as well, where he refers to kind of the serious, heavy, you know, political data of Berlin of the Malik Fairlock circle as Dada, whereas his version, because of course they were always on his case for, for not being a real Dada, because he wasn't left-wing enough supposedly, and he coined this term Dada as his, as his, as his, as his, as his version of Dada, which is more playful, less politically implicated and invested and so on. So um, uh, it, so it's either, you know, movement through space to different places or movement within a change within a particular um, oeuvre. And, and hybrid identities, which we coined, uh, I guess we didn't want to say hybrid identities, uh, uh, then addresses uh, the ways in which uh, some of these artists try to think of even the post-human or the, or the, um, the kind of um, the, the robotic or the uh, combination of genders and and so on. So I, I think it's worked out quite well. And uh, yeah, I mean, we can talk about this more later on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this sounds great. Yeah, just to make it more explicit, the kind of gesture behind these specific, behind the specific way of organizing the contributions was to move away from geographic yes. ways of of organizing this content and so within each section we tried to it didn't always work but we tried to make sure that we had contributions from different um, countries in central and eastern europe um, within uh, each section and so so as to get get away from these geopolitical ways of um, framing and studying the data movement exactly and, and and thank you for that and and i didn't talk about topographies but topographies which would imply that we're looking at different you know different countries even there we tried to get away from that by 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 trying to bring together um contributions that actually um talk about the way that uh, um, uh, uh, artistic practices were, were manifested in different countries, or or or, or kind of incorporated uh, movements from, from from different countries into their own into their own practices. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we tried really hard <laughs> <laughs> to yeah. to subvert these 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 standard um, categorizations. Mm -hmm. Should we go to our fashion participants? Do we need to? Do anything on that front, or are they? Uh, I believe they are. They should be able to unmute themselves. Then I can um, yes. go to the next um, so. slide. So, Gabor and Nersha, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and thank you for having us via Zoom. Can we go one slide back, please? Thank you. So uh, I just want to talk very briefly about the origins of the volume as uh, it originated in uh, our research group at the Kosciak Museum in Budapest. This is a very small museum dedicated to a uh, leading figure of the Hungarian historical avant-garde, Lajos Kosciak. He was a, a poet, a writer, visual artist, and also editor of several magazines that were 
the, the leading forum for the Hungarian avant-garde movement. And he was also very active in organizing the Hungarian avant-garde movement during the 1910s and 1920s. Uh, this museum is part of the Hungarian Museum of Literature, and it uh, has been operating since the late 1970s. We house the uh, archives of Lajos Kossák, both his uh, uh, archives connected to his uh, literary activities and his visual arts. And for the past one decade, we have been working in the Kossák Museum in a way to expand the scope of the museum from a, a memorial museum dedicated to one particular author to include a broader scope of the Hungarian avant-garde and also avant-gardes in Central Europe. So our uh, research and exhibition practice has been focused on uh, much more on the context of the Hungarian and uh, Central European avant-gardes and not solely on the activities of Lajos Kossák. And uh, since uh, uh, 2015, we have been engaged in several research projects focusing on the, uh, the, the history of the, uh, of the Hungarian avant-garde uh, visual arts and, and literary arts, as well as the history of Kossák's magazines uh, as uh, you may have heard in the introduction, uh, uh, we currently have a research project focused on the correspondence of Kossák uh, and his partner, Jolan Simon during the 1910s and 1920s, which is also connected very much to the, uh, the general history of, of the avant-garde movement in Hungary. Um, we have organized several international conferences. And in 2016, we have organized, thank you, a conference dedicated to uh, Dada in uh, Eastern and Central Europe. Uh, 2016 was the centenary of, of Dadaism. And we were very happy to be able to organize an open call conference together with the Institute of Literary Studies at the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. Um, the conference included um, young and mid-career researchers from the Central European region, but we also had keynote speakers invited from uh, the United States and, and Western Europe. Uh, it turned out that uh, this conference had had a very uh, wide scope uh, as in the volume. Uh, during the conference, we also talked about different genres and not only literature and the visual arts, but also magazines, ephemeral uh, performance activities, and also uh, lifestyle strategies were addressed. Uh, one year after the conference, there was a special issue uh, of the Hungarian literary magazine or a journal Helicon published with a selection of the essays translated into Hungarian. But right after the conference, we decided that we should try to expand uh, the, the proceedings of the conference into a, into a much more uh, concise uh, volume about a new history of Dada in Central Europe based on uh, uh, the notion of techniques, as Irina has already mentioned. And we were very happy that both Oliver and Irina accepted our uh, uh, request to join us uh, in this venture as co-editors of the volume. And uh, we were also very happy that Brill has accepted uh, our proposal to publish this volume in this in the series of avant-garde critical studies, which is a very well established uh, series of uh, volumes, edited volumes on the history of uh, the historical avant-gardes, and uh, also has a uh, a thematic focus very uh, similar to our volume which is uh, not to separate different genres and techniques of the avant-garde, so not only fo to focus on the visual arts or literature, 
but to to have a more holistic approach uh, to the uh, products of the historical avant-garde. Thank you. Gabor? Um, hi, um, next slide, please. Um, so, um, hello everyone, first of all, and uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, it's good to see some of you, and um, I'm especially happy to have the first book launch of this volume at the Harriman Institute, because exactly a year ago, I was a Fulbright scholar there. So, so it's a really, uh, it's a big moment uh, to me. Um, well, um, evidently this, this volume reconsiders Dada articulations in and from East Central Europe, but why do we even talk about geography? Um, well, first of all, because Dadaists themselves often conceive their activity in geopolitical terms. Um, for example, Tristan Tsara's projected anthology um, entitled Dada Globe imagined Dada as a non-hierarchical network. However, the prevalent concept of the globe that structured the volume is still fundamentally a, a geopolitical notion. Um, from the earliest accounts, Dada historiography has also been concerned with uh, geopolitical aspects of the movement the artistic institutions which historicized and canonized Dada were interested in geography and were eager to erect Dada centers. Alfred H. Barr's seminal 1936 MoMA exhibition entitled Fantastic Art Dada Surrealism highlighted the importance of such cities as um, Zurich, Paris, New York, Berlin, Cologne, and Hanover. The focus on these cities contained an implicit hierarchical bias that came to dominate uh, Dada scholarship and was lent additional support by the Dadaists themselves, who took part in the canonization of the movement. The six cities narrative was reinforced during the Cold War, given the fact that these locations made part of the Western Bloc with the significant exception of East Berlin, uh, of course. At the same time, archives were often difficult to access in the Eastern Bloc. It is not by chance that the precursor of our volume entitled The Eastern Data Orbit was published in the 1990s uh, when archives in the region opened up. Um, nevertheless, the six cities narrative continues to be a trope in data historiography even today. In 2006, MoMA, together with other uh, trend-setting venues, organized an extensive traveling data exhibition that narrated the history of the movement by highlighting the same six cities uh, identified by Barr. Um, next slide, please. Um, our volume goes beyond the data centers and expands its focus to East Central Europe for, uh, from two aspects. Firstly, by dealing with data-inflected phenomena produced in the region, as my colleagues already uh, talked about, uh, the volume assumes that avant-garde artists in the region actively and critically interpreted data. Um, the first two case studies of the volume, for example, examine this phenomenon by uh, talking about uh, Prague, for example, as an active periphery, as uh, Jendrik Thoman does in his um, paper. Um, another paper highlights the inter-peripheral influences on avant-garde artists, that is the connection between Prague, Bucharest, Budapest, and Novi Sad without the mediation of such centers as Paris or Berlin, um, argues Emmanuel Modok. Um, secondly, the volume investigates East Central European aspects of the canonic Dada artists. Um, as a number of studies in this volume focus on the hybrid identities of artists from East Central Europe who contributed to Dada in the canonical uh, centers from the Jewish Romanian origins of Tristan Sara to Raul Hausmann's elected Czechoslovak uh, identity. Next slide, please. Finally, I would like to tell you a few words about uh, what we mean by East Central Europe. I won't rephrase here debates over the legitimacy of the notion of East Central Europe, um, but I will tell you that the designation of the volume refers 
primarily to Romania, Poland, Hungary, and the former Yugoslavia, and also Czechoslovakia. Um, but this geographic uh, focus is not prescriptive. Uh, the omission of data techniques in Ukraine, Bulgaria, and the Baltics is in this volume, for example, is not intentional. On the contrary, we try to engage with scholars dealing with these areas, but um, in the end, unfortunately, uh, in vain. Um, to sum up, the aim of the volume was not to be encyclopedic, uh, and we didn't want to present a polished narrative about the region. Uh, on the contrary, we hope to inspire new uh, research in and about the region and open up new discussions. Thank you. Thanks, Kaba. Yeah, thank you. And sorry, yeah, Megan, if you want to say something sure. about your contribution. Yeah, and uh, I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you all for being here. Thanks to those of you online. I appreciate the opportunity as uh, the sole contributor, uh, not editor, to speak about the book, uh, to be invited as a sort of local node representation of uh, research on East Central data here in, in New York. Um, and I thought I would frame my remarks. Uh, I'll talk a bit about my own contribution, but also as a sort of response to uh, what we've heard already and what I read in the introduction, the framing of the, the book, which I think I really appreciate the way that it um, highlights these networks happening in the moment of um, this data formation of the more or less intra-war avant-garde period, and also the way in which it highlights this network that's happening now among scholars who are uh, working um, in this field. So, so many of the, the contributors to the volume, you know, I think we've all had opportunities to work with in various aspects, and it's really nice to kind of see all that come together here. Um, and for me also to uh, find new names and new topics that I hadn't known before. So I see that as a real um, exciting contribution of the book. Um, and having been sitting with it now for about a week, uh, something that stands out for me, as in I received this book a week ago, so <laughs> as you can see, it's pretty big, and uh, I didn't read the whole thing. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but um, so sitting with it in this time, uh, one thing that uh, I was really drawn to was your editorial framing of the book around um, a focus on local specificities. Uh, rather than sort of, uh, which, you know, kind of um, veers towards this uh, potentially nationalist discourse, but rather moving away from that um, with a focus on giving detail to um, these moments that might be considered Dada or may not, but really giving detail to sort of local movements, local events that, uh, for example, Western data is readily granted, but oftentimes when we are talking about these notions from Central Eastern Europe, it has to be sort of in conversation mm -hmm. with what's happening to us as though to validate it. And something that um, I've written about also in um, Art Margins in a text on the Czechoslovak Deviatil and data, uh, really trying to write away from that kind of uh, comparative approach mm -hmm. Um, towards something that uh, allows for specificity within this sort of uh, larger understanding of movements that uh, even complicates potentially uh, what is or is not Dado, the question you opened with today. Uh, so those were all things that um, really draw, drew my attention. And then I just wanted to um, kind of highlight, uh, not having read the whole book as a disclaimer, uh, you know, some of the, the articles that popped out to me working with, uh, from colleagues I've worked with in the past, for example, Przemysław Zdrożek's text on Polish reception of Dada, or Alexandra Shiriak's uh, kind of questioning of high and low, talking about uh, consumer culture and why or why not that might be um, cons considered or talked about within the Romanian avant-garde. And then a real surprise new uh, discovery for me was Christina Sofia Saba's text on the Vichnoe Künstler, from which the, the book's um, cover image is taken, um, and tracing the cliches, or as I call my research process blogs, this way of um, sort of sharing images across the avant-garde that's really central to my own research. So finding a new name, a new text, which you know I'm already citing in my work, was uh, really exciting and like immediate 
uh, result of this book. So there's just a few comments on uh, the contribution that I provided to the volume. Um, so Oliver and Gabor have both already spoken about networks, I'm sorry, archives. And I always like to uh, start by thanking Christoph Vansha at the National Museum in Prague, who provided me access to archives of Mira Holzbachova, whose leg you're seeing here. <laughs> um, and I actually first visited her archives in 2020, um, in the summer of 2020. So uh, in a moment where things opened up in Prague, so it was really an essential and very challenging um, uh, access that he provided to me in that time. So I always like to start by acknowledging that and what the archives have allowed in sort of constructing um, a narrative around this particular figure, very little known uh, within Devyatsel Mira Vosbachova. This image is from 1926, a Devyatsel exhibition at the Dum Umyotsu or the House of the Artists in Prague. Um, and if we can go to the next slide, just above her leg here is this photo montage, which um, was reproduced on the cover of a Czech avant-garde magazine uh, in black and white, but the original I actually found in her papers in the archives. So we see here um, the, the use of various colors. Uh, this was cut and pasted from different posters suggesting sort of the way they're highlighting um, the repetition of her name across various uh, Poster, uh, posters for performances by the Liberated Theater, or Osvobos and Edibado, which you can see a little bit at the top here, which was the theater division of Devyatsil, this uh, major group of the Czech avant-garde. And um, so Polsbachova is a really fascinating figure for her participation in these avant-garde movements in the early 20s, uh, and then really um, having sort of a lifelong um, uh, career as a as an activist, as a dancer, as a choreographer, as a cultural uh, figure. Um, and her, her stance in this period and in the 1930s, strongly anti-fascist, anti-colonial, is really embodied, embodied in the work um, that I highlight in this volume and had the opportunity to speak about already at Columbia in a, a series of talks that uh, Sasha uh, organized a couple of years, 2021. And so you can, uh, we can, you can hear more about her online there. Um, but just for the, to, to wrap up in the context of Dada, as well as surrealism, and we could go to the last slide now, I think. Um, Kolsbachova uh, really staged in this period, the decline of Europe as it is becomes overtaken by fascism. So this is her dancing as Madame Europa. Um, right now, you know, here crowned and, um, um, in that role, but by the end of this uh, of this work, she is sort of disfigured and deformed as Europe had been uh, in the 1930s in her rendering. Um, so the opportunity to sort of highlight her work within this volume on Dada without uh, necessarily being forced to inscribe her within defi pre-existing definitions of Dada is just, I think, one example of the ways in which the volume kind of um, opened up or sort of um, reconfigured notions of these data tactics or techniques that you've all talked about. Um, and I'll just wrap it up there because I know we want to uh, come into discussion, but thank you. Yeah, thank you a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah, th th this is amazing um, to hear from, from all these different angles, uh, your uh, take on the book. And I think the book is, um, Astonishing in terms of how uh, how much of a new uh, perspective provides uh, on Dada, uh, namely Dada is usually referred to a precursor of surrealism in the Western scholarship, and I think what your volume brings to fore is showing actually how in Eastern Europe it emerged with constructivism, and that is like a huge huge difference in terms of how, how do we look on data or data techniques in general. Um, there are examples, of course, in Western Europe that constructivism was merged with data as in the case of uh, Netherlands or, or, or uh, German, uh, German uh, uh, um, context, but I think the Eastern Europe was very much uh, specific, specific in that terms. Mm -hmm. uh, and not only looking at the constructivism, but as you say in your introduction, this desire for political revolution, for a social change, or for the role of art in changing the uh, uh, socio-political 
uh, uh, context, uh, I think that's maybe something that this volume also brings uh, forward as an important um, important uh, characteristics of uh, uh, Dada in the in the Eastern Europe. Um, and uh, also, you you claim that in uh, this hybridity or cannibalism, the notion of cannibalism, you say it's not only um, linked to this delayed reception, but it, it becomes a critical appropriation that is an active synthesis. Um, and um, maybe like having these like just few things that I picked up from your introduction, I want to ask you, uh, do you now when you when you uh, have this experience of compiling such a uh, such a big uh, volume, do you maybe have um, um, something more specific to say that uh, Eastern context brings forward that we cannot find in the West? Uh, what first comes to my mind are, for example, a uh, text on Romanian uh, avant-garde in the first part in typographies. They are mentioning this merger of visual and textual in terms of uh, photo poetry that is so specific for Eastern uh, uh, East European context. And we don't find that this at this early period of the 20s, uh, so many examples in the Western Europe. Uh, and it's even more so the case with Russian or Soviet context. Um, so maybe I'll just ask that question and then open the floor for, for our guests to, to jump in if they have a comment or a question. I, I think that's a great question. And I, I feel like you led us to the answer a little bit, right, with yeah. the, the suggestion of photo poetry as something that um, maybe is perhaps not unique to the context, but certainly gets taken up a lot more in Central and Eastern Europe and including um, Russia than it does uh, in uh, in the West. Um, so yeah, I guess thinking about media that that that's a good um, uh, specifically Central European feature to draw to. Um, and then in terms of the ideology, um, as you uh, mentioned earlier, um, I think there's something very different about the politicization of art from East Central Europe at this time from places that have not yet become nations or are about to become nations or are very young nations, right, where it kind of paradoxically merges with certain nationalism, sometimes disturbing features of this nationalism, um, but at the same time with a desire to um, undermine the hegemony of Western art. And so anyway, I feel like the kind of political dimension of Central and European, uh, Central and Eastern European data to my mind, differs really from um, the kinds of things that we find in the so-called Western data. It's, but it's so complicated because we're also looking at, at uh, artists uh, who are from East Central Europe who are operating in, in, in Western Europe. So it's it's really hard to say. I mean, I'm really interested. I've never thought, I actually have never thought of this, uh, this photo poetic um, idea. I mean, I, I, if I if I think about Moholy Nod, you know, he comes up with this photoplastic mm -hmm. idea. Uh, which the dynamics been... of Metropolis later on while he was in Bauhaus. Yeah, um, yes. Um, the, yes, in, in, in the context of film, absolutely. And, and uh, um, but he was operating in Berlin, right? So, so and then the question is, is he, is he at that point a part of the Berlin avant-garde, which is probably he is more so than or the Hungarian avant-garde, and the same with others who were oper operating in Paris. So, 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 you know, the, Romanian, the Romanians, yeah. for the most part, who were operating in Paris. But uh, but it is interesting that a couple of the uh, contributions do underline the way in which some of the Romanians were, in a sense, also excluded within the context of France, for example. Um, and they themselves practiced exclusion of other Central European <laughs> artists while at the they same, were in at the, at the same time. So, <laughs> so uh, you know, no one is innocent, and everyone is is guilty, and 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 everyone is innocent at the same time. I don't know. It's it's it really is complicated. And uh, what I what I like about this volume is that we kind of complicate things, <laughs> <laughs> which which is just an accurate reflection of the way things are in the world. Um, I mean, I was thinking about, about what you were saying earlier about New York and the way that New York has been canonized, even though it was Jada avant la lettre. You know, had that exhibition been organized, had it been possible to organize that exhibition, you know, in Moscow or Kiev, then it would have been Kruchenich and Zaum, you know, which was Dada Zem avant la lettre, right? Mm -hmm. So you could go either way. And it's, you know, what happened in 
in the Russian Empire at that time was unbelievable. I mean, it was just amazing, amazing. Uh, uh, the proto data and very rich and very, very uh, sophisticated. It's in in a sense, in a sense, we can also think about this. And we didn't we didn't really get into the discussion about the uh, the definitions. But there's this book entitled "The Lands Between." I kind of like that idea as well, even though again, it's kind of a marginalization. <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, it's I think problematizing the the uh, the center periphery pro um, uh, yeah, um, uh, topos, problematizing um, you know Western Eastern, problematizing media hierarchies, problematizing you know uh, uh, masculinist approaches all this is super important and i think we've 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 attempted that in this in this anthology but as we also say in the introduction we hope that this will be a kind of a basis for further research and further and, and i hope further complication of, of cultural history yeah, yeah thank you yeah I, I should add that definitely in terms of methodological approaches you bring something new specifically each chapter is is kind of reflecting that the texts within it have different methodologies. Uh, and I, I really find that interesting and, and enriching. Thank you. It's good to hear. Um, yeah, I mean, I think just to the last point that you made there, Oliver, like one of the challenges of putting together a volume like this is by trying to make visible certain networks, whether we're talking about historical networks or the networks of scholars, um, there, it opens up as you also keep mentioning these exclusions or gaps. So what it throws up are questions about what is not there, which you also, I think, wisely point to in your introduction, for example, a querying of data or these other um, aspects that um, don't make their way in here. And so it's sort of a, an opening up for further conversation. Um, and beyond that, I mean, to to uh, to Sasha's point, I think that's a really interesting question that you kind of posed as like, as what is a sort of um, a unique contribution as potentially of Central Eastern data rather than how is it like what we already know so well. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's something too, that these, these uh, contributions do a really good job of platforming. And maybe even without even starting from that question, just you know, talking about these things on their own terms. Well, thank you. And I'll I'll also invite our audience to ask question, or if there is no question, I can continue. <laughs> yeah, it's if yeah. Gabor and Nersha also yeah, want to oh, sure, exactly. Uh, Sorry. Talking about inclusion and exclusion. Feel free to. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so if it's okay, I, I, I would like to add something because Sasha uh, highlighted that um, it's very unique that, for example, in, in the East Central European context, Dada was merged in a way with, with constructivism. And I think that uh, there are very unique, you know, um, results uh, of this merging of the two movements together. For example, in the case of Koshak, who uh, uh, started uh, uh, focusing on Dada uh, in 1921, uh, it was already a conscious choice to, to use the techniques of Dada and to, use the, and to use the techniques learned from Russian constructivism to um, to, to 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 create a very specific message and it was uh, uh dada was was used or um included in his art theory and and his uh visual and and poetic practices uh because of its uh, of its power of this uh, deconstruction deconstructing the language deconstructing the the former means of art and constructivism was used in a way to create a new um, new world, a very utopian world. And this was very important for Koshak, these new techniques that he encountered because of, uh, especially because of the political context in Hungary, where after the First World War, there was a communist revolution for a very brief period of uh, four months. 
And uh, right after the fall of this uh, communist takeover, they were forced to exile the country. And uh, he was very dissatisfied with the with the results, uh, especially on the on uh, cultural politics of this communist takeover. And so his new approach towards culture, towards the uh, workers' movement and, and everything included was very much shaped by this very conscious choice to incorporate Dada and constructivism at the same time. And he was able to create this new uh, mixture. Uh, of course, this was all very politicized and... Uh, uh, which was not, you know, um, alien of, of Dada, especially in Germany during this period, but he already encountered uh, Dada as something of a historical movement, which has already begun uh, several years earlier, and he was able to build on all the results. Uh, and this was, the, I think that this was... Um, the case of several other artists in this region that they were able to encounter Dada not at the start but at at a moment when it already had uh, resulted in several new techniques that they were able to incorporate and uh, and form and reform to their own tastes and their own means. Maybe Gabor has also something to say. Yeah, so uh, if we are talking about what we like in the volume, uh, I would highlight uh, the context that some of you, the, the, the highlighting of the historical context of a given country that some of you uh, has already um, uh, underlined. Um, because um, like in, in Peter Burger's uh, theory of avant-garde, uh, states that Dada and surrealism was important because uh, these movements subverted the bourgeois sphere of art, the, the, the autonomous uh, sphere of art. But in Central Europe, um, most of the time, this autonomous sphere of, of art was either non-existent or almost non-existent or very narrow. Uh, therefore, um, Dada or avant-garde in general in these countries um, are not um, directed toward uh, the apathy de bourgeois uh, or apathy la bourgeois against the bourgeoisie, but to, to create an audience, to direct themselves toward um, um, workers' movements, for example. So um, um, many of the studies in the volume uh, investigate this process of in finding an audience, creating an audience, thinking about um, um, the power or the potential of, of art, avant-garde art, to um, to politicize people. So it's again, it's not unique to Eastern Europe. For example, Berlin data was very political, but um, it is um, it was striking to to see that um, in 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 many. Uh, papers, this uh, problematic is uh, is analyzed in one way or or another. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I'd I'll, I'll like to open the floor if anyone has a comment or a question. Yes, Bradley? Sure, yeah. Thanks, guys. This is great. Uh, such a cool volume uh, and, and great presentation about it. Um, I, I was really curious about the, the, the last couple of things that uh, both Nosha and, and Gabor said. Um, and, and going back, I think, also to something Oliver said earlier, um, where obviously the political situation in Eastern Europe is totally different in the interwar period than it is in, in Western Europe. Um, there's obviously the, the Soviet Revolution. Um, but then you have, you know, nation states that are there for the first time, a lot of sort of instability, Hungary goes to this sort of uh, a communist revolution, very short-lived, and back, back and forth. And usually, and this is, you know, coming from a place of, of ignorance that you guys are heroically working against with this volume, uh, but my sort of like conception of Dada and this sort of Western manifestation is largely a movement of critique, right? A critique of a decaying bourgeois Western civilization, 
Um, and but the way that you guys are talking about this, at least in, in the last little bit, is it seems like in Eastern Europe, maybe there's a little bit more of a sort of creative, sort of constructive utopia going on here instead of less less critique or, or still critique, but the political aspect of it is actually trying to make something, trying to, as Gabo said, figure out how to make audiences, you know, for, for these art movements. You know, and, and maybe that is connected to the fact that these are new states really trying to figure out how, how they're moving forward. Anyway, I wanted to ask if that is the case, if that is maybe one of the things that might answer Sasha's question about what the East uh, has to, to uh, sort of contribute here. And then to go back to the topic of, of the book or in the, the subtitle of the book, is there like a, a set of tweaks to data techniques that take them from critique Right of this sort of like Western civilization decay to something that you can use to sort of build an audience, create something new, make an image for a positive utopia. Is there a way that those data techniques that do one thing also do the other, or do they have to be tweaked in order to 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 make them work in, in the other way? If there are any examples from the book, that'd be great. But just broad broad abstract thoughts for us to Thank you. Yeah, that's a that's a. Good question and more concrete in terms of maybe you can say a few words about a technique or few of them in that regard. Um, well, I was actually thinking about Hungarian activism more broadly, actually, after what Nersha said about Kashak specifically. And one of my favorite things about the reception of data within the Hungarian avant garde is um, what happens to polemics around data after their Viennese immigration or their, their Viennese exile, um, where certain artists who were part of the Hungarian activists end up um, taking the side of data and saying that, well, if we're in a capitalist country in a capitalist civilization, we need to use data as techniques to agitate for the revolution. Um, but then the other side says, no, we can't do this. Um, and these techniques are inadequate and we have to build uh, uh, toward something new. And so um, that kind of faction looks uh, toward Soviet Russia. They look toward um, constructivism in part, but not only. Um, uh, yeah, exactly. Although I guess in, uh, the it's Hungarian yeah, Hungarian variation of it. Not Bodenovia necessarily, yes. although possibly. Yes. So, so I think um, some of that polemic, I don't know, Bradley, if that answers your question, but I feel like that goes way beyond critique of bourgeois society to thinking about, um, you know, whether or not data language is at all kind of uh, can can be useful in uh, creating, promoting revolution in some ways. And so, just kind of how that debate um, fractions the Hungarian activists. I think that 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 uh, Gabor and Mesh's points about the the different political situation of these countries is key, is absolutely key. I, I really do agree with that. But, but then it becomes a question of, yeah, how do these techniques and how do these, how does this approach function in a different political environment? Because one can always think of counterexamples. I mean, there's, you know, there's uh, Tell von Duisburg and, uh, you know, De style and Meccano at the same time. Uh, how is that different from, you know what what uh, Kashak and Mohinlal were doing with construct international constructivism, and uh, I, I think probably it, it, there is a difference there, and that difference is based on um, is is a result of the different political situation in those in those countries and the different national projects or lack thereof, because one can also think of counterexamples. I mean, of examples in there was a communist, a brief communist uh, republic in. Um, in Munich that lasted for one month. There was actually one even in Bremen that lasted for three weeks, for two weeks. Uh, you know, so there are always, you can, one can always think of examples, you know, on, on both sides of the, the Leuta or the Leita, whichever, and, and the Vistula, whatever you want to uh, think of as a divide, which is probably uh, fictional anyway. Um, but the, yes, the, the differences in the political structure of the countries is really key here. But that applies also, that would apply to, you know, if we looked at Portugal or we looked at Spain, um, it would apply in every case. But because there is a certain commonality in East Central Europe at that historical moment, that really accounts for these, these differences. I think that's really, that's really key. 
your question about techniques or is really interesting. I know gotta think about that a little bit more. Um I mean, we we talked about photo poetry, or yeah, uh, like a, just the sheer fact that the border between genre don't matter any longer for Dada, right? While there are borders geographically that has been have been changed after the First World War, it kind of kind of reflects on each other. Some sort of impulses that work against the canon. I mean, and that would be a, a technique, right? This like fusion of genre, for example, that Dada is very much into. Um, yeah. Which is rude in futurism. Which is the futurist, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think like in the Czech context and thinking about Karl Taiga, who was the leading figure of David Sully, and this question that you're asking Bradley is sort of at the center of this other text, not the one that's in here, but that I've written on Dada and David Sill and how they are or are not um, interconnected because at one on one hand Taiga was looking to Zara with a lot of interest, and on the other hand looking to what's going on in the Soviet Union and really um, using a constructivist framing for this, what you're talking like new world building. And at the same time, really interested in a nihilistic version of data that's, uh, that it ultimately equals nothing. So how those things kind of come side by side. And I think Miracles Bakova, even if maybe we should frame her work as data, it fits within this kind of technique that was happening in Czechoslovakia, specifically out of Bruno, uh, as, um, you know, where there were all these, like, sort of Dada balls for it, which also Ian Jim has written about. Um, so maybe that's uh, one answer. But at the same time, I do think there is this appropriation of critique from Western Europe and all the baggage that comes with that. So you do see as well, and should be said, and is not, is only just starting to really become a, another note of focus within Dada research is this exoticizing and racialized aspect of Dada critiques specifically, or not necessarily specifically, but maybe especially in performance. Um, so so there is also that, this adaptation and also, yes, like something, something new and different happening there, which then maybe makes the term Dada, which is maybe a very not dada thing to do, but maybe makes the term Dada no longer um, <laughs> and there is, I think, like par paradox is very important within Dada in terms of they are anti-militaristic, but they're at the same time wage cultural wars mm -hmm. in each of these contexts that are specific, as you said. And also at the same time as they were as they were critiquing the, the very basis of Western epistemology. I mean, in, in, in my first encounter with Dada was was reading Tristan Sarah's text very closely. And I, I discerned something very constructive, actually, and mm -hmm. very nature oriented. And that was true, actually, with uh, Hugo Ball as well, mm -hmm. certainly with Hans Art, mm -hmm. um, with a number of them. At the same time as they were, as, as they were trying to demolish, you know, the very foundations, epistemological and otherwise, of Western, of a Western civilization that they that they saw as self destructing during the First World War, they were always already building something. So this kind of, um, I mean, what, I mean, Kashak articulates it very clearly in this, you you must destroy the build and you must build to be victorious. This, this, uh, this, um, um, this kind of, uh, yeah, the slogan that, that was so beautifully articulated on, on the pages of Ma um, was, I think, inherent already in, 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 in Zurich Dada as well. Um, so, yeah, it's 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 really difficult to. I think it's a deeply anarchistic generalize. idea, if yes. you want. I mean, yes, like absolutely. A idea. Yeah. I mean, well, like which a... anarchistic or communist? <laughs> <laughs> Anarcho communist, or yeah, like it goes along the along the uh, both lines. But um, but yeah, the the destruction is a creation sort of slogan. That, that becomes important for that for that is like across the board it seems um but yeah i'm talking too much if we have another question hi thanks very much i was wondering if you could just look at the temporal um framework of the book and how, how you chose the parameters of when start and end and also is do you see that as an advantage of studying the idea from this eastern perspective does that challenge any of the chronologies that 
Um, so we, we definitely include pre-data, pre-Zurich data artistic activity within the rubric of data. So we kind of start the counting countdown or whatever um, a bit earlier on, although that whatever beginning point is not entirely clear. And I think it's somewhat arbitrary in the case of um, the kind of Zurich data as well. Um, a lot of it is just uh, mythology that was created um, later by the data artists themselves that say the most important founding act of data was the naming of the movement, or it was, uh, you know, something in New York data and the artistic works that they produced or something like this. So um, uh, I think, I guess we're kind of pointing to the arbitrariness of precise chronological borders for data in general, but also for Central and Eastern Europe. And it comes in with Emil uh, Sitio as well, who's, who's canonically, I, you know, um, uh, accredited with, uh, as a co-founder of Mistral uh, in Zurich as being kind of proto-data, which he vehemently denied as they've never been a data. So yeah, it's, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I just wanted to put that in there. Yeah, no, no, yeah. I mean, that, that's a great So, point. So it's, a, it's, it's just, it's, un, it's unclear where things start anyway. So we're, we are actually critiquing the canonical, uh, chronological boundaries of data, but let's take it into the 20s and 30s because we do take it there. We do, yeah, and we have one contribution that also considers data techniques in the neo avant-garde too. But I, that that's kind of an exception, I think, and it, it's it's also balanced with historical data. Yeah, uh, so that, it's that's mostly, you know, uh, yes, yeah, um, but mostly it's 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 focused on the historical data period, but with these borders kind of a little bit more washed out than they usually are in. Uh, more canonical narratives of Western data. So you, I kind of sense that you raise something, Megan, in that, in that in a sense, you know, if one if one critiques every aspect of the definition of data, um, it kind of it kind of also erases <laughs> erases something called data, which which is kind of appropriate in a sense because that's maybe what the the original canonical data sort of yeah. wanted. I don't know. I mean, I mean, th there are paradoxes yeah. here that we're always pushing against, and I, the intentions that we're always dealing with when it comes to both chronology and geography. Yeah, because in some ways, its canonization is its failure now. So, like, it, like you point out in your uh, introduction with these MoMA exhibition, it, it it becomes something that can be museized or exhibited and so forth, and and thus it's its failure as much as a mark of its success. In a sense, you know, rereading the introduction, I, I feel that we could have. And, and and being self-critical here, we could have maybe emphasized or we could have played a little bit more with the metaphor of cannibalism. Because in the end, cannibalism is not only uh, kind of uh, incorporating something into your body, it's incorporating something into your body which uh, what you're eating is is something of your own kind. I don't think I don't know if we emphasize that enough, maybe in our in our introduction and thinking about that as a metaphor. But I think that that, but it might, you know, it, it might be important to remember that, you know, a cannibal, it, a cannibal is not someone who eats something. A cannibal is someone who eats some something of their own species, of their own kind. So that there is ab ovo a kind of a, a recognition in the in the metaphor of cannibalism that you are incorporating something that is already yourself. I don't know if I'm making any sense here. Um, that, which, yeah. which is how the culture behaves. Exactly. Right? It eats its own product in order to come up with something new. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. And in the case of Zenitism that has been all also referenced in the book, um, there was a film made in the 80s called The Medusa Raft, which is all about cannibal <laughs> rights. Like that's a story yeah. mm -hmm. um, to play with the same metaphor. Mm -hmm. uh, Gabor and Merche, do you maybe have something to add to the discussion? <laughs> Not to put you on the spot. Not, not right now. <laughs> well, maybe okay. we can reverse the question on you, Sasha, because you also had a volume uh, come out recently of Zenitist texts that also have a lot to do with the region and with Dachism. So yeah. what would you say is um, specific to the yeah. region? I mean, granted that yours is 
focused on the yeah. sort of context more. more I guess we will have hopefully conversation about that book, <laughs> uh, but I maybe like th there are a lot of things that overlap. But I'm more interested in uh, in another question. I'm more interested in uh, when we talked together uh, to raise the question of the future of Pomanger studies. Mm -hmm. And um, I was like thinking, could we learn something from Dada techniques, West and East, whatever geographies, and incorporate that in our scholarship and how that would look like? Mm -hmm. Because uh, there is this book uh, by Jonathan Culler about literary in theory, how the theory uses literature, literary techniques in order to innovate itself. So you build suspense while you are writing scholarship or you, you know, throw metaphors and similes and whatnot. So my question would be like, would avant-garde scholarship benefit appropriating some Zadeh's technique in itself and becoming more creative, more experimental? Does this sound interesting or you, 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 mm -hmm. you think? Um, I don't know. Just I think it can be useful for yeah. for all cultural history. Mm -hmm. Like a, a kind of a, uh, I, I I really feel that that uh, you know there, there's there's a really deep problem with medial hierarchies that that in Europe go you know can be traced let's say back to the 17th century and the establishment of the academy in France. It's still with us, you know. We've not. We we don't seem to have. We we don't seem to be able to shed this, this this kind of um, uh, uh, ossified I idea in our mind that there is a certain that there are certain media that are that are canonized and others that are less important. But there's a hierarchy, a kind of leveling of that hierarchy. I think if we think of Dadaism as having possibly started to do that, although it was futurism actually that yeah. that 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 was more important in that respect as 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 one of the essays points out mm -hmm. um that would be that would be something that would be really useful in in future avant-garde and general cultural historical certainly art historical scholarship and perhaps a more predictable answer just in terms of actual geographic boundary crossing i feel like a lot of our contributions though we fit them into a non-national framework within our volume, a lot of them still do consider the specific figures that they study within the local national context. And that is both an advantage, as Megan pointed out, because you really kind of get to narrate the history of uh, that artistic movement from the local point of view, rather than vis-a-vis -vis some Western canon that you have to pay mandatory tribute to, but it's also a kind of limiting factor in terms of the comparative aspects of it. So just kind of adapting the spirit of transnationality and crossing borders and transpositions and so on um, in, in this way. And, and in a sense that that's applicable to, to data, to examining any kind of data um, activity, West or East or Central or or whatever. I mean, looking at the specificities is super important, I think. Um, yeah, I brought with me an example, which is uh, like a miraculous reappearance of Walter Benjamin, who published uh, uh, recent writings in 2013. I mean, that's, this seems like a very Dadaist move in terms of writing, and it's a book about art history. Um, just an example. Okay. With the Peter Modrian's uh, painting made in 1971. <laughs> I mean, Peter Modrian died earlier. <laughs> um, there was a presentation. Right? Oh yeah, there, there is a miraculous reappearance of of Alfred Bar, who uh, Gabor mentioned, who gave a lecture at Eflux uh, about the unmaking of art, um, and another was by Gertrude Stein. So, um, <laughs> well. I don't know whether we have a question online. Unfortunately, we don't, but maybe you have here. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for a very interesting presentation. And you mentioned this briefly, but I, I just wanted to ask whether you maybe noticed working on the volume some difference between uh, difference in like 
from Chandra dynamic between different national um, contexts, of, like in, in Naga, maybe it was like, because, I mean, avant-garde movements were pretty masculinist, but for example, at least like in the Soviet Russia, we can see some like different gender than there were more women, more women artists involved in the whole uh, in the context. So was there is was it different in different national contexts? Do you know what anything? It's all pretty masculine. Yeah, <laughs> I'm yeah. afraid. Maybe yeah. Russia is the, is the exception at a certain moment. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think part of the issue is the association of women artists with performative genres and how difficult it is to study those things and how little record there remains of that. Um, and I think Megan's uh, article is a kind of a testament to that because you have to go to great lengths to uncover this narrative um, of Mira Hosbachova and her participation in Gerozio and also engagement with um, data strategies, techniques, and so on. So um, I think you know that 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 is a real serious limitation. I feel like with the Russian avant-garde, because there were many more women artists who were painters, for example, yeah. right, and left a substantial you know, legacy that could be museumified and, um, you know, introduced into art historical narratives at some point. And also just more broadly within the Russian avant-garde, I think so many of the women worked in artist couples and kind of had a very different kind of support system. Um, and I guess there are some examples within the Hungarian avant-garde too um, of, of this, but uh, we know very little of them. And I, I guess maybe another issue specifically in relation with the Hungarian avant-garde is translation. So um, uh, with the uh, women poets who were engaged in uh, Hungarian activism or were adjacent to Hungarian activism, um, you know, with major... Uh, male Hungarian posts, they're not translated into English, um, <laughs> much less women poets. So it's it, I guess barely it's, known in Hungarian as well. Yes, I mean, yeah, I mean the course. research on Azji Uyvar is really important, uh, you know, from this perspective. It's, it's I'd say one of the articles is emblematic uh, by 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 Hubert's last name. Is Vandenberg. Vandenberg, yeah, uh, where where he kind of um, engages in a very complicated kind of uh, uh, analysis of possible puns as 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 like, like, like almost like a nested hierarchy of possible puns as a as a means of exposing uh two women in specific who may or may not have been referred to uh obliquely within within the literature of data or the, or the documentation of data and the results are in the end unclear and in any case these women may or may not have wanted to Accept the label of Dada. So, so this this article maybe is emblematic of how, yeah, pretty masculinist in the end. Well, um, at the same time, uh, I think it's a cr tricky question because there is a historical invisibility of these women in in avant-garde in general and in, in East Central European avant-garde especially, because as you uh, mentioned, they there were many women in, for example, in Hungarian avant-garde and um, poets and, and performers, um, but they were um, sort of invisible or, or became invisible in historiography. So it's, they were there, but we know uh, very little about them. So I, I would distinguish these uh, two, two things. And the masculinist dynamics are, are there in, in historical avant-garde, of course. Um, however, at the same time, um, East Central European avant-garde had, um, I think, a huge um, emancip emancipatory uh, potential as well. It's not by chance that many uh, women were um, attracted or involved in in um, avant-garde activities. So I think um, that the question is, is pretty uh, dialectical <laughs> in this sense. And it's certainly like a double process of double exclusion in that they were definitely excluded in our historical narratives that were written afterwards, 
but the a lot of the male artists with whom they were collaborating as part of those avant-garde movements had not a small part in their exclusion as well. Right? If we look at Kashak Sma and publication of Erzhi Ulibari or other female artists, they are very small. There are very few poems uh, published by comparison with uh, uh, male poets or something like this. So it's kind of multiple um, points of exclusion, uh, I guess, that are working. But, to, but they were there, yes. Yeah, yeah they, they, they were, were there. there. I don't know, of course, in, yes. In, in numbers, Just, yeah. yeah. And then also in terms of artist couples, Lucia, Mokoye. That's a prior <laughs> exclusion. Which, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, which, yeah, there will be an exhibition in Prague of her work. Well, thank you a lot. Congratulations again. Um, and I, yeah, I would do, urge everyone to engage with the book. There is also an e-book uh, through the libraries of the universities, and it's a great resource for uh, classrooms. Thank you again. Thank you, Sasha. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, the Institute. Thank you. Thank you. I do have some flyers somewhere in case oh. anyone wants to take flyers yeah. that have a discount code for a very expensive book, so you know, no uh, pressure. Yes, so good night. <laughs> Thank you guys. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>